Uh, <clears throat> there's a reason for them because of where we are in our series in Revelation. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. For those of you that like just good old fight songs, you know, who is on the Lord's side, the fight is on. By the way, I, I forget what the, exactly how the joke goes, but, uh, but basically the fight is on is not supposed to be the theme song of your home. Uh, it's talking about spiritual warfare, uh, not, uh, <laughs> not the uh, theme song of your household. Um, but and then lead on, O King Eternal. But Revelation chapter 19, if, uh, if you're able, please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. And we are um, really closing in on the end of Revelation. Uh, still some quite uh, important, profound things, uh, powerful things to, uh, to see here as we uh, look at these last few chapters. But we are getting much closer. Uh, Revelation chapter 19, and we'll start reading in verse 10. Uh, Revelation 19 and verse 10, And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled." with their flesh. Tonight's message is the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and uh, this uh, powerful moment uh, that would be one of the most climatic in history and uh, just profound, powerful things happening here in multiple ways. And Lord, help us to uh, uh, learn from your word tonight, be challenged, convicted, help us to apply these things to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. So last week, as we uh, looked at Ver uh, Revelation chapter 19 and, and saw the uh, description of the marriage supper of the Lamb, verse 10 says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so you cannot separate, the, uh, you cannot separate proper, uh, prophecy and the testimony of Jesus. Because what prophet, you know, and, and sometimes prophecy is looked at as a novelty and it gets people fascinated and, and uh, ooh, prophecy, and they get so fixated on the events of prophecy that they forget about the person. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Yes. And then there are some who maybe neglect prophecy. They neglect prophecy. But you can't separate prophecy from Jesus Christ. They, they go together. Testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And in verse 11 and following, we see more of the revelation of Jesus Christ because that's who it's all about. That's who it's all about. Now, there are some quite amazing events here that we see described uh, that can be, uh, some people can maybe allow to be distracting, but throughout the entire book of Revelation, the main emphasis, the main focus is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's all about him. And uh, so in verse 11 in chapter 19, it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. 
Now this uh, battle, this uh, Armageddon, uh, will be the most climatic battle in world history. How is it the most climatic battle? Because it's thousands and thousands of years in the making. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty uh, climatic battle. Uh, because even if you look back uh, at, um, uh, you know, don't turn there, but when you look at Genesis 3.15, it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Now, I was talking, uh, uh, God was talking to the serpent there, the devil. I put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And the bruising of uh, the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the, that happened at Calvary. Uh, but then Jesus conquered death, and he rose from the dead. Uh, but there's also then, there's going to be, it shall bruise thy head. That will be the final defeat and crushing of the old serpent, the devil. And so this enmity, the word enmity means hostility or hatred. That there would be, even all, even all the way back uh, at the time of the, in the Garden of Eden, just shortly after the fall of man, uh, there would be, there was this prophesied, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. What would that be? That would between thy seed and her seed. So all the way back for thousands and thousands of years, there has been a, a hostility or hatred between the, the serpent's seed, the devil's crow, the devil's seed, and then the seed of the woman, which was the, the line that would bring forth the Christ, the Messiah. And that has, there's been a conflict, there's been a clash there ever since. And the serpent, the devil, has always been trying to blot out, to corrupt, to get rid of that line, uh, the line that would lead to Christ. And, uh, and even today, uh, the devil still uh, has a hatred for the seed of the woman and the, the promised seed. Uh, and then that nation that brought forth, that God used to bring forth the Messiah, the devil still has a hatred for the nation of Israel. And uh, that, that hatred is what we see when Antichrist uh, uh, comes on the scene and then halfway through um, commits the abomination of desolation. And so there's the deception that takes place. And, oh, yeah, we got the Messiah here. But then they realize, no. And then the full fury and wrath of the Antichrist, the devil, gets poured out against Israel. And, uh, and, and there will be... Um, uh, and there's more that, that takes place, and, and there will be a remnant that is saved, and God will preserve the nation of Israel as he promised. Uh, but that, that battle, that's been going on for a long time. But then on the other hand, there's been this rejection of Christ as a whole by the nation of Israel, for the most part. There's, there, are, uh, there are those who are uh, studying and, uh, and, and, and reading, and I know there's people who are trying to get the word of God into the hands of Jews. There are Baptists in Israel. There are, uh, you know, there are Christians in Israel. Uh, but uh, the nation, for the most part, blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so there are consequences for that as well, that they will go through. It's a time of Jacob's trouble. And that's part of the reason for the tribulation is that chastening and that final, that final chastening and then preparation for uh, Christ. Uh, to come and set up his kingdom. And then uh, for the uh, conversion of the remnant, and so the nation of Israel be preserved. But that enmity, that hostility or hatred has been going on uh, throughout for thousands of years. And after, <laughs> think about this, after the thousand, uh, thousands of years of world history, and then seven years of the greatest tribulation that the world has ever seen, the battle between God and Satan, between heaven and hell, between good and evil, comes to a climax. That's, that's, that is, that by far is the most climactic battle, <laughs> the most climactic war in world history. You can look back at history and see wars in the past where things just start to build and little things happen here and there and there's tensions that increase. Think about that happening over thousands of years. The tension that increases and increases and increases. And I think that's why, as, and I, I'm, not, I'm not a pregnant, I'm not gonna be a date setter or predicting, oh, in a certain number of years, but I do think there's a reason why tensions continue to build and build and build throughout the world. You know, it's as if the world is just waiting for something to happen. 
And uh, what would that be? Would that be World War III? Maybe, I don't know. But, uh, but things, things happen little, they happen small, and then they build and they get big. They happen slowly and then all of a sudden. <laughs> That's what happens. So, uh, but we see a lot uh, going on, a lot developing. We see a balance of power shifting to the enemies of Israel and the world. We see the reduction, the, the decline of America that's happening and the balance of power shifting to China, Russia, and the influence. And there's a lot of parts of the world they're looking to say, you know what, let's get away from the, the uh, ambitions of the West or the ambitions of the United States and them trying to strong arm people into doing their will. And, and China and Russia are saying, let's lead the world in a new era. Let's lead, let's lead a, let's have a different way in this world, and then more and more we're seeing them being strengthened. No matter what the uh, propaganda artists say about the weakening of Russia and how all of that sanctions and everything are working, no, Russia's doing just fine uh, with the help of China and other nations that are, they're, they're just saying, we just, we just got to get away from this U.S. <laughs> they're not being very nice to us. <laughs> um, but, um, but anyway, we're seeing the balance of power shifting. We're seeing even Saudi Arabia and Iran even reapproaching each other, which is huge. Now, Iran is a longstanding enemy of Israel. Saudi Arabia has been more of an ally of Israel. But we're seeing the, the pieces just shifting a little bit. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the years to come. This will be the most climatic battle in world history, and it's spoken of in Zechariah chapter 12. Turn in your Bible to the, um, uh, toward the end of the prophets, uh, Zechariah chapter 12. So go to Matthew and take a left, and you'll go to Malachi and then Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 1. Another intriguing thing that's been happening, particularly as it pertains to Israel, and I didn't realize this was happening. I'd heard about the, the desire for judicial reform, and there was something going on there, and there's been these uh, protests and things. But there's also something that the ultra-Orthodox party in Israel has been trying to do for uh, years and years. Every single year, they introduce a law that uh, uh, they want that in the Knesset that they want to try to pass that would completely prohibit the preaching of the gospel and, and trying to convert people to other faiths. And particularly, and, and those the two particular people who've introduced it this year uh, have said, you know, it's, it applies to everybody, but they're really targeting Christians with it. Uh, now, it doesn't sound as if it's going to pass. In other years, it had no chance of passing. The difference this year is that that party as is part of the governing coalition, the ruling coalition that Netanyahu uh, has to, in order to form a government, he's got to work with these different groups. Now he's come right out and said, no, this, we're not going to support this, we're not going to do this. But it's interesting uh, that, and then you pair that with the judicial reform. I read an article about more of the moderate and liberal Israelis, some of them looking at leaving the country and the country's getting more and more uh, orthodox in, in, its, in how it's turning. You know, how, how much so it is, you know, that was just probably one perspective, but, you know, very, very intriguing things happening that, you know, I look at, say, well, how does that all fit into the future? But we, we don't know completely until uh, time transpires and we see more. But Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 1 the Bible says, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah, and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength, and the Lord of hosts their God. Uh, in that day will I make the governors of Judah like an hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire 
in, uh, in a sheaf, and they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness in it for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as the morning of Hadad Rimon in the valley of Megiddo. And then turn to uh, chapter 14 and verse 1. Now remember in, in the books of prophecy, there are often a combination of meanings in, in what's going on. Some of the books, and you see this in Isaiah a lot, see it in Jeremiah, there are things that per directly pertain to what was going on right that, at that time with the prophets. And then there's future events that are injected in there that, as, as, it says, uh, as, as the saying goes, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And so there's a lot of parallels between what was happening back then with the captivity and then what is going to happen and you know, God's deliverance of them back then and then God's deliverance of them at the end of that seven years that leads to Armageddon. And so we're going to see that here, verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Now here, this is, uh, notice, all nations. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the, house, and the cities shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. But notice that verse 4, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And that's a very clear reference right there in that verse to when Jesus comes, set, sets foot on the Mount of Olives. And so it's a matter of, of, of looking at, okay, the books of prophecy, what is it talking about particularly, let's use for example, uh, pertaining to the Babylonian captivity. There are certain prophetic uh, scriptures that speak directly about that, but then right interjected in, or right after that, it then talks about Christ's kingdom, Armageddon, or whatever the prophecy that is, is yet to come. And uh, so that, that's just what, what we see uh, so many times in uh, the prophets uh, as it is written. And uh, so we get an indication of what's going to happen in the book of Zechariah. Now the, back to Revelation chapter 19. The grand entrance of Christ and his saints will be one for the ages. It will be one for the ages. Notice in verse 11. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so just I'm going to go down through the, uh, each uh, description about Christ coming. This is Christ on the white horse. And we see the white horse. He's the true king in Christ. Unlike the imposter Antichrist who was also portrayed as coming on a white horse initially. And uh, he's coming in with, uh, as a man of peace, but then, he, but then that turns, quickly turns to war. It quickly turns to pestilence. It turns to death and blood and destruction. But with Christ, he remains on the white horse, and true peace will be introduced at that time. 
He's faithful and true. He's faithful and true. He was called faithful and true. Jesus is faithful to keep his word that he's coming back, and he's faithful to fulfill the prophecies about Armageddon. Uh, And he's also faithful to keep his promises to the nation of Israel. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Keep your finger there. We'll come back shortly. But turn to Acts chapter 1. And we see a promise of him returning in like manner as he left the earth. Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And so he's, he's telling them, is there, he taught them about the kingdom, he ta- told them about the kingdom, and gave some examples of what, uh, what the, oh, many parables about the kingdom. And so the kingdom was very much a focus during uh, Christ's ministry uh, with the apostles. But as he's leaving, he gives them a different command. He's not saying, usher in the kingdom of heaven on earth. He's He's telling them, but first they ask him, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom again to Israel? Is, it, is now the time for the kingdom? You've, you know, they've, he told them about the kingdom. But then he says, that's not for you to know the times of the seasons. That's, that's the Father's business of the timing of all of that, which he's put in his power. But here's the power that you will be given, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the other most part of the earth. So he's saying, God has certain things in his power pertaining to the kingdom when that's going to happen. But here's what's going to happen. The Holy Spirit is going to come and endue you with power. For what purpose? To evangelize, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Starting, it was starting in Jerusalem, and then in the surrounding area of Judea and Samaria, getting outside, a little more outside their borders, and then to the uttermost part of the earth. So that's what I want you to be focused on, not worried about the timing of when the kingdom's going to come, but doing the work, fulfilling that commission that I've given you to do. And then he said in verse, uh, verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Now notice this. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And so that was, the ascension was a literal bodily ascension of Christ. And so in like manner would be he's coming back personally and that's when, when we read, as we read in Zechariah, he's going to set foot on the Mount of Olives. He's going to come down and uh, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain shall be made low. And he's going to, uh, well, the battle of Armageddon commences and then his kingdom commences. Uh, the thousand year, uh, the millennial kingdom, which then leads into his eternal kingdom, new heaven and new earth. And so this is going to be one for the ages. This, what a grand entrance when you see that... Um, He's faithful and true. White horse, he's called faithful and true. He's faithful to keep his promises, and he is true. He's true without any deception or error. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is the truth. He's the very embodiment of truth. There's no error in him. There's no deception in him. He also judges and makes war in righteousness. Now, this is a very key thing to understand about the Lord. You know, God has been smeared as being a bully in the Old Testament. 
You know, there's people, ah, we don't like that God of the Old Testament. Boy, he's just so mean. He's just so... They don't, number one, they haven't even read the Old Testament, I'm pretty sure. Uh, <clears throat> or they just read the parts they wanted to read. And, um, because there's a whole lot of God's tender mercies and long-suffering and loving kindness in the Old Testament. Yes. Filled, with, I mean, all kinds of that in the Old Testament. So they just, they just view God and how he dealt with nations and, and, and people in the Old Testament. Oh, God's just a bully. He's just... Um, but every judgment that God makes and every war that he fights is right. It's for the right reasons. You know, in history of America and in the history of the world, there, there are different reasons why wars get started, and you can debate whether it was a good idea to go to war or not. <laughs> Say, was that under, is that for the right reasons? Are we really, should we be going to war in this case, you know? And that happens with other people's wars. But what God decides to do, any judgment or any, any wars that he decides to take part in are in, for righteousness, makes war in righteousness sake. Uh, atheist Richard Dawkins has called God arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. Uh, some years ago, uh, Rob Bell wrote a book called Love Wins, which includes a denial of eternal hell and he says, hell's kind of just what you make of it on earth if you don't receive God's love, is, is basically what he said. Uh, but a denial of literal hell. And puts the idea, he, 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 uh, uh, he promotes the idea that everyone is ex ultimately will be accepted by God. Love will win out in the end. Because God is love. But he calls the preaching of hell misguided and toxic and a cheap view of God. Well, that could be said about his view of God. He has a very cheap view of God. But that's what he... But, and so, there are those who would say, you know, God's justice, his judgment, we, we don't like to hear about that. We don't like to read about that. We're going to redefine who God is and how he operates. We're not going to take the whole counsel of God and look at God in, in, in all the ways he's revealed in Scripture and how he operates. We're going to pick and choose what we want to, to take. I turned to uh, just uh, not too far back, uh, Jude, just before Revelation, Jude, and we'll read verses uh, starting in verse 14. Jude. Notice as he judges and makes war in righteousness, um, we see uh, this is another prophecy of um, Armageddon, God's judgment on the earth. Verse 14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. That's him coming on the white horse with the saints coming behind him. And uh, as uh, Brian Sharp has said, you know, for today, some people are for a jihad. At this time, it's going to be a yeehaw. <laughs> you know, riding the horses. Um, <laughs> it's a yeehaw. Yeah. But behold, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so that's what it's going to be all about is the judgment of the ungodly. They've spoken against him, they've rebelled against him, and God in his perfection and his holiness and his righteousness, in, in righteousness he judges and makes war. Verse 16, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Um, you know, and that, that's... Um, you know, that's we're going to band together. You scratch my back, I scratch your back, and you know, let's 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 join hands and we're united. We're going to stick together. There's going to be no sticking together. The sticking together isn't going to work. Um, the favoritism isn't going to work uh, when it comes time for this to happen, even though that happens a lot today. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Now, the connection, mocking and walking after their own ungodly lusts, really the root of the issue is we want, I want to serve the flesh. This is coming from the mockers. 
I want to serve the flesh. I want things my way. I want to do what pleases the flesh. And then when the message of God's word con conflicts with that, then the mocking comes. Because really, I I'd rather... I don't want to have to give an account to God. I don't have to live according to God's way. I want to live according to my own lusts, but they are ungodly. They, they are opposite of what is of God. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now, I like um, uh, these verses. I didn't have this written down to read, but I just like the sound of it. Verses 24 and 25. Now, unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Psalm 119, 160 says, Thy word is true from the beginning, and of every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. God's judgments are always righteous. Every one endureth forever. They will not pass away. Now, Jesus, back in uh, Revelation 19, Jesus is described as, uh, with eyes having a flame, as a flame of fire, having eyes as a flame of fire, and he's described that way earlier in Revelation. And this represents his omniscience, as all things are open before God. Nothing can be hidden from him. Uh, there are many crowns on his head. And the devil has some crowns. The serpent, the beast had some crowns. But those crowns are only temporary. Those are earthly, worldly crowns. They're temporary. Uh, temporary kingdom. But Christ has all authority. And his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Uh, he is a name unknown by man. You know, and even though there's so much the Bible tells us about God, it still doesn't describe everything about God. It doesn't, really ca it doesn't capture all that God is. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And this is, uh, illustrates his identity as the one who atoned for sin with his blood. His name is called the Word of God. And he is the eternal word of God made flesh. John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word's, word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And verse uh, uh, 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so he is the eternal word of God made flesh. His name is called the word of God. Uh, and then the armies that follow him are the saints who are also described as faithful. Isn't that great? It's not just Christ who is faithful, but the saints of God are counted as the faithful. And they're coming along for the ride. And you say coming along for the ride because you notice they really don't have to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see that. Uh, you just get to be along for the ride. What an exciting time. Uh, and then uh, going on, he is a uh, sharp sword out of his mouth. Uh, in, uh, let's uh, read, uh, actually, let me go back to verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And we covered that earlier in the chapter. That is the righteousness of saints. That's having the righteousness of Christ uh, applied to your life um, and imputed righteousness, not our own righteousness. And it's that pure, perfectly clean righteousness of Christ. That gets applied to our lives, and then that allows us to have, be reconciled to God, be forgiven of our sins, and have peace with God. And then in verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. Now the word of God, I don't think it's, it's not an accident that it says a sharp sword goeth out of his mouth. Now whether this is going to be an actual supernatural sword that goes out of his mouth, Perhaps, or it could just simply be his word comes out and it acts as a sword, literally, and smites the nations with it. But either way, we'll see the result of that sword um, a little bit later in this chapter, toward the end. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. You know, when he rules them with a rod of iron... No more rebels against God will be able to continue without consequences. You know, it, it, there's so many times here, there, there, there are many, so many, the multitudes of people who live in rebellion against God, yet it seems like, you know, God doesn't really do anything about it. 
but he's, he's storing things up for the day of judgment, for the day of wrath. And there will be a time when he does something about it. Look at, uh, let's turn to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Psalm 2. And verse, uh, we'll start at verse 1. The Bible says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. You know, that's the Antichrist crowd. They're united in their opposition to God and Christ. And they say, let us, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. You know, God's too restrictive. God's too restrictive, according to them. We need to be free. We need to be liberated from God, from Christ. We don't want to have anything to do with that. Notice verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. He's, he's saying, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are that you think you're going to have your way against me? God was not laughing at it, somebody's joke. He was laughing at the futility of the rulers taking counsel against him and trying to defeat him and stand against him. Verse 5, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I would de declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now listen to this. He's, he's given them an opportunity. And this is where, you know, people uh, try to smear God and, and call him unfair or call him, just say he's mean. He's, he's, um, uh, he's as Rob, uh, Richard Dawkins, he's the most unpleasant character in all of fiction and, and smeared as being a bully and all the accusations against God. But notice that even when there is the declaration of judgment and accountability. He gives an opportunity. He's long-suffering. He's giving people space. And that's why he's not doing as much about the evil and the rebellion as maybe we wish he would at this point. Because he's still giving people space to repent. Uh, verse 10 be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Like, pay attention here, be wise, use your head, and, uh, <laughs> have, some, have some common sense here. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. And it says in verse 12, kiss the sun, and sun is capitalized. What does that mean? That means get close to the sun, get right with, get right with Jesus. <laughs> get right with Jesus. Lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Mm. He's saying, look, there's a blessing available if you just put your trust in him. Put your trust in that promised one. And that's why the Psalms are so rich, and not just the Psalms, but other uh, prophetic books, of speaking of the Messiah who hadn't even shown up yet in person as far as the incarnation of Christ as we have in in uh, the um, uh, accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And yet, Christ is all throughout the Old Testament. And here, kiss the Son, lest he, lest he be angry and you perish from the way. Why? Because there's coming a day when Jesus will come back on a white horse. He's going to set foot in the Mount of Olives. He's going to wipe out all the nations that come against him, that come against Israel. And uh, he will take care of things and justice will be served. And at that point, it will be too late. But God has given so much time, so much time for people to get right with him. As a matter of fact, and I don't have this passage uh, uh, on my notes tonight, and I don't remember it right off the top of my head. I think it's in 1 Peter. But uh, the, the Bible says that God is long-serving. He's, he's God is, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long-suffering. Uh, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That context, the context of that verse, has to do with him coming back and judging the world. And there, there's all people mocking, where is the promise of his coming? Uh, things continue on and on and on. It still hasn't happened yet, and you keep saying it's going to happen. 
There's a reason for that. God is long-suffering. He's, he's not slack concerning His promise. He's going to keep His promise, but He's giving people space to repent because he, he doesn't want anyone to perish. By the way, the same God, the God of the New Testament is the same God of the Old Testament, and His heart is still the same as far as how He deals with the people and giving them opportunity to be right with Him. Uh, back in uh, Revelation chapter 19, uh, he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And this, this uprising against Christ will be unsuccessful. And some of the verbiage here, that might sound familiar uh, to a song, uh, with a song, uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And I realize that's kind of a, more of a battle war song for, <laughs> you, know, you could use for armies. But the, some of the words, uh, they actually apply to the scripture here. Now, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Uh, he has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible sword. His truth is marching on. Glory. Okay, all right, stop. Um, anyway, uh, just too many songs that come to my head when I read some of these things, like, you know, the other one, For the Lord God Omnipotent Reigneth. You know, that just comes to mind. But, um, but that's the same idea. He's... he's Treading the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God in its time, uh, those things, these things, that the uprising will be unsuccessful. He's got a name written on his clothing and thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is King of Kings. It means there's no one who gets close to the authority of Christ, and all earthly authorities are ultimately subservient to him. Now, God's given them space to do what they're going to do, and all of that still in the big picture uh, scheme of things, still works in accordance with his will. Uh, even though they are not right with him, uh, they are still being used by him. And, but they're, they're ultimately, none of them are above God in authority. They don't even get anywhere close. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, Brian Sharp says the thigh, the significance of the thigh, was the place of security, promise, strength, truth, and the fastening of weapons. And he gives a couple of scriptural examples. And if you do a search on the thigh, look at the thigh in, in Genesis with some of the accounts there of, uh, of promises made, put, put your hand under my thigh. And so there is, uh, he gives some references about that. Number three, so number one, Armageddon will be the most climatic battle in world history. Number two, the grand entrance of Christ and his saints will be one for the ages. And number three, the fate of the beast, false prophet, and antichrist armies are sealed. Uh, there, as we move on here in 17, uh, verse 17, chapter 19, there's a different kind of supper that's described here. Last, <laughs> last week we uh, focused on the blessed marriage supper of the Lamb with his saints, with the bride. What a, what a great blessing. What a wonderful supper that is. Now, I kind of picture this, at least if it's chronologically this close together. So you have the marriage supper of the Lamb, mm -hmm. sitting, you know, the, the, the wonderful time with the Lord and his saints. And you sit down to eat and you have this meal. All right, let's get up. It's time to get on your horses. We're going down there. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to picture it that way. I don't know. It's exactly like that. <laughs> but time to get on your horse. Let's go. We had it. We're filled up with our meal. Let's let's get going. Um, but uh, here, there's a different supper described, and not as pleasant of a supper. A very gruesome supper, actually. Yeah. And verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And in that case, I, see if I can find this verse. I don't think I can find it. But, the words, this, this uh, reference to the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. It doesn't matter your standing in society. Everybody will be treated equally in the eyes of God according to his justice, whether you were with him or whether you were against him. Whether you're small or great, a king, a captain, mighty man, uh, and it even says the flesh of horses, because they're going to be riding horses too. 
Now there are some that have wondered, is, is horses there just figurative? Is it just because that would have been more common back then? But here it just says the flesh of horses, which leads me to think that should be literally that's talking about horses. They'll be riding on horses. Now, I don't know if this is actually what will happen, but you know, it seems like the world in a lot of ways, in some ways is getting more futuristic, but in some ways is also going backwards to where it, won't be, it wouldn't be hard to see. And, and especially, you think about after seven years of tribulation and God's uh, judgment being poured out on the earth, His wrath coming, uh, the, the earth is going to be in shambles at that point. And they're just, that, horses are going to probably be all that they can do. I mean, their charging stations are going to be destroyed. Their solar panels are going to be destroyed. Uh, their <laughs> even, uh, unfortunately, even the refineries are going to be destroyed. So, um, but... Uh, <laughs> The, but all of that's going to be destroyed. So they're going to have to go back to a very primitive, agrarian type of, of approach. And so it's not hard to see when you look at all the destruction that's going to take place uh, if, if they're back to riding horses. And if, you know, in the United States, if inflation gets much worse over the years, all of us are going to be back to riding horses too. Um, you know, some of you will be prepared already, but um, uh, some of us are going to be walking. Um, or maybe a bicycle, I guess we'll see. But, um, but that's a different kind of supper. Brian Sharp tells this story. I, I heard him say this in uh, a message. A, uh, I think we have a CD that has, he tells this story. But he also, uh, in his Revelation commentary, tells this story. He said, several years ago, this author was privileged to be invited to a top secret military post about, upon Mount Hermon in Israel. It is the highest point in Israel that rises some 4,000 feet above sea level. Early in the morning, there were some buzzards catching the updrafts below us. We were actually looking down upon them as the morning sun arose and heated the rising air. With their wings expanded, they continued gliding higher and higher as they gained an elevation. My comment was, those are some large condors. He said that to the Israeli soldiers. He said that to the Israeli soldiers escorting me. They must have six feet wingspans, I stated. The reply was, more like eight feet, Mr. Sharp, from the commander. We don't know why they are here, he said. We don't know why they are here. And so Brother Sharp took the opportunity to share some scriptures that describe the supper that will take place that involves those birds. <laughs> and uh, he said, oh, we don't know why they're here. Well, maybe they're, maybe they're getting ready. They're getting called. Not, not quite. I mean, the calling will come when it's time. But... Uh, interesting uh, situation there. The, uh, so as we read, as we continue, the, uh, the Lord, out of his mouth goeth a, sharp, goeth a sharp sword, he smites the nations with the sharp sword, whether it's his word, whether it's actual sword, however that uh, ends up transpiring. And so that's why the army's traveling behind him and just get to be along for the ride, because Christ is the one who does it. It's really not going to be much of a battle. And now at the time, it's going to look very bleak for Israel. Because, I mean, you have this, the multitude of nations converging. And it's going to look really bad. And that's when Christ shows up and delivers. And then they look upon him whom they have pierced. And they'll realize, they'll realize he's the one. As a nation, they pierced him. It was the nation that was behind that. They pressured the Romans. They said, yes, his blood be on us and our children. But yet there'll be a time of national repentance for the nation of Israel. Christ will deliver them, keep his promise. And so the destination of the beast and false prophet is the lake of fire. Uh, verse, uh, verse 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken. So this is now he's given an overview, uh, zooming back out. Here's the beast, uh, the kings of the earth. Verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And we're going to deal with that later. Uh, uh, chapter 20 uh, deals with the lake of fire. And so we'll deal with that much more later in a future, uh, the next probably couple weeks, few weeks here. And at the beginning, uh, actually verse 21, the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled 
with their flesh. It's going it's to be a gruesome sight. It's going to be a, uh, a terrible event for those who are on the receiving end of Christ's judgment. But as Psalm 2 says, kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish from the earth. There's still time to repent. There's still space to repent. doesn't matter, small or great, rich or poor, mighty man, high ranking, low ranking. It doesn't matter status in life. There's still space for everybody to repent and get right with God while there's still time. And at the beginning of chapter 20, the devil is locked up in the bottomless pit. Now, whether the world knows it or not, <laughs> it's headed to Armageddon. That's, that's where it all ends. That's, where, that's, that's, the, that's the climax. That's going to be that's the main event in world history. I mean, yes, there are many main events in world history, such as the crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and the birth of Christ, and all those things, the creation. But when it comes to this battle, when it comes to the culmination of God's plan, that everything from thousands of years before, whatever, however, whatever time frame that ends up being, I'm not making any time predictions. I'm not saying, well, in 50 years or 100 years or 30 years. I'm not saying that. But whatever time frame it ends up being, that the whole, all of it gets wrapped up in just right there, Armageddon. And Christ comes, stands on the Mount of Olives. Uh, the Mormons would say the Mount of Olives and Independence, Missouri. Uh, I'm not sure why. <laughs> but the Mount of Olives. <laughs> That's replacement theology for you, you know. Um, but the Mount of Olives we know in Scripture... <laughs> And he's going to, his kingdom will come, a thousand year millennial reign. And really, it's a thousand years because it is set as a thousand years because there's one more thing that happens after the thousand years and then transition into a new heaven and new earth. That's why, so once Christ sets up his kingdom, it really doesn't end at that point, even after the thousand years, but there is a break there after the thousand years as far as some events that are noted in Scripture and which we will deal with as we close out this book of Revelation. So the outcome is already certain, and true justice and judgment will be served. Think about the souls that were under the altar that were slain, that were spoken of in Revelation, that they're saying, How, lo how long, O Lord, dost thou, uh, you know, until you avenge those, that have, you know, avenge our blood? And there is coming a time. God's keeping track. He's not lost track of anything. No matter how evil the world gets, no matter how wicked the world gets, no matter how perverse the world gets, no matter how rebellious the world is, God is keeping track of all that. He's got an appointed time. We need to trust His timing. We, need, we don't need to be shaken. We don't need to be impatient. We don't need to be... We just look by faith toward that day, toward those events, toward those things when Christ is going to set things straight. There's a movement of, uh, there's so many now, so many Christians, so many professing Christians that think that they are now, that the job now is to usher in Christ's kingdom. And that's just not our job. We are to see people added to God's kingdom, spiritually speaking, through the preaching of the gospel as people trust Christ as their Savior, you get added to be part of Christ's kingdom. But we are not, this earth has nothing to offer as far as Christ's kingdom is concerned. We are not to try to redeem the culture. We're not trying to change the culture. That's not the church's job, is not to change the culture. The church's job is to preach the gospel, baptize, and disciple, and stay faithful to the word of God for churches, to have faithful, sound churches that are true to his word, that are doing the work, that are functioning as the pillar and ground of the truth that, that we're supposed to be, that God has designed the house of God to be, the house of prayer, the house of worship, the house of his word being read and preached and taught. That's our job. That's what we're supposed to do is continually just occupy till he comes. We stick around. We're still here for a purpose. That's why the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost came down to empower the disciples there to do what he told them to do. Not to usher in the kingdom because he says that's in the Father's hand. That's the Father's business. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me. That's, that's who we are today as witnesses. We're witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. True justice and judgment will be served and Israel will be delivered as Christ establishes his kingdom. What a day that will be. And so Christ fights 
for the saints then. Christ fights for Israel then. He takes care of all of that. Today, we need to fight the good fight of faith. The fight is on. Who is on the Lord's side? And then we just say, lead on, O King Eternal. We're following you as we press on. And if there's someone here today who's never been part of, never, you've never entered God's kingdom through salvation, through trusting in Jesus Christ, you can be saved today. Make your, make your peace with God now. Make peace with the Lord Jesus Christ now so you won't have to face him in judgment in, that, in the way that the lost will face him in judgment. And you can trust him today. Uh, just recognize your sinful condition, your need for a Savior, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ.